Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to the Produce Safety Educators Call number 44, where we're going to be talking about building capacity in your training team. This is Gretchen Wall, the coordinator of the Produce Safety Alliance and Northeast Extension Associate. And before we get started into today's call, I just want to go over a few quick instructions and in that on this call, all participants, both Colin and those who are logged into the Zoom meeting are going to be muted just through the presentations. And then um, both Connie and Annalisa are going to have some time where we'll pause for discussions and questions. If we don't get around to answering all of your questions or you have something to share, by all means, feel free to share that information to us in the chat box if you're logged in online. Or feel free to uh, send myself, Annalisa, or Connie an email after the call. We're always um, open to any ideas or comments or questions that you have after the call concludes. We also will be recording this call and it will be posted on our website. Um, in the next few days, and that's where you can also find all of our previously recorded meetings um, and uh, presentations from previous educators' calls. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Connie Fisk, who's going to be talking about building capacity in your training team and, and talking about uh, mentoring and how to give constructive feedback. So uh, Connie, I'll let you go over the agenda for the day. All right. Gretchen, I'm still seeing the home slide. Have you forwarded it to slide I, three yet? Yes, I have. Let's see what's going on here. Right now I see it, but it's presenter view. <laughs> there we go. Okay, sorry about that. It's all right, thanks. Okay, so today I'm going to give a little bit of an introduction about why this topic is important um, or why I think it's important. I'll talk about mentoring in general and I'll talk about some tips for giving feedback. And then also briefly talk about some other important topics that I think it's valuable to discuss with our training teams um, for all those unexpected situations that might pip, um, pop up during a training. And then I'm going to turn it over to Annalisa. Um, she's going to give us the example of how their um, produce safety training team has evolved in Minnesota and then give you guys an opportunity to share uh, your success stories with mentoring others or even how you've been mentored that you have found really valuable. All right, Gretchen, next slide, please. Okay, so common causes of team dysfunction. Why do we care about mentoring? Why is feedback so important? So the first one I would say is conflicts between different organizations that make up a training team. For example, in some states, the Department of Ag and Cooperative Extension have a really great relationship. But in other states, one or the other tries to control the trainings. And maybe if they're the funding organization, that's their right. But it can lead to some real resentment in the training team. In other states, there may be perceived turf wars between different universities. And neither of those scenarios is productive when it comes to serving growers. All right, next bullet. All right. Training team leadership is unclear or ineffective, and that one we're going to talk about quite a bit today. Um, and it is pretty self-explanatory, as is the next one. Click the next bullet, please. Oh, it moved. Sorry. Click the next one just so that, yeah, there we go. Um, lack of trust and respect between training team members. Again, we're going to talk about that one more in later slides as well. But that's why building team relationships and camaraderie outside of trainings are so important. And then finally, training decisions are not focused on best outcomes. As an example, I often co-train with new trainers. Um, that's something I really enjoy is mentoring, which is why I'm giving this um, webinar. Um, or I train with trainers that are assigned to a module they're uncomfortable with. And I understand they need the experience in the mentoring, but I would argue that an integrated training is not the best place to start. If we know that members of our training team need practice, Rehearsing in a Zoom call before the course will improve the quality of that course itself, as well as the example we're setting for future trainers taking that course. And again, that's my opinion, not necessarily the opinion of everyone at the PSA, but I like to take time before the course to work with those trainers that need a little extra help first, 
rather than day of the training. Um, understanding the strengths of our training team members, we can assign them topics that allow them to shine. Um, so a better experience for the growers in the room as well as the trainer themselves. And then we can mentor them in those areas that they need or want help in. As I said, maybe by having a Zoom call ahead of time where they can practice. Now I understand that some training team dysfunction may be out of your control as individual trainers and even as team leads. But I also believe that each of us has the power to help make our teams better. And that's what we're going to focus on today. Next slide, please. So trainer engagement affects the quality of PSA grower trainings. And again, Gretchen, you can just make all the bullets show up. I didn't think about all this animation when I put it together. I apologize. So symptoms of poorly performing teams that affect the quality of PSA grower trainings include trainers that come unprepared or that phone it in. Maybe they're just reading the slides with no effort to motivate or explain the concepts to growers. They're just trying to get done. Or trainers that can't answer basic questions about the content, even when the answers are in the notes, like they haven't studied it themselves. Trainers that show up only for their talk, they don't contribute to the training as a whole. They get there five minutes before they need to hit the stage, and then as soon as they're done, they leave. And trainers that demonstrate a lack of interest in learning objectives. Now, the module learning objectives are there for a reason. Knowing your audience, you may even have additional learning objectives. But the point is, we're covering this content for a reason, not just to get through it because we have to. We could show growers a series of videos and call them trained, but we believe that the value of the training is not in the certificate, it's in the learning and empowerment that allows growers to create safe produce for our food system. This helps them protect their businesses from foodborne illness outbreaks, protect their customers, and also protect their businesses from repercussions from rule non-compliance. And strong teams help us do that. And again, you'll see the, the examples on this slide are all about trainers. So if we build up our trainers, we can avoid these engagement pitfalls. Next slide, please. I like this uh, November tweet about leaders. It says, bad leaders provide no direction at all. Okay leaders tell people exactly what to do and how to do it. Great leaders work together with people to figure out what should be done and then empower them with the resources they need to do it well. So for those of you on the call, which kind of leader are you? I admit I'm mostly an okay leader, but I strive to be a great leader and I've focused quite a bit of professional development efforts on improving my skills because it doesn't come natural to me. So today I'm gonna to share with you a little bit of what I've learned about mentoring and providing helpful feedback. And this goes for everyone on the training team, not just the one that's wearing the leader hat, right? We can all be leaders on our PSA training teams. Next slide, please. All right, so now getting into the meat of it. What is a mentor? According to Funk and Wagnall's Standard Dictionary, a mentor is a wise and faithful teacher. So again, anybody could be a wise and faithful teacher. Another definition of a mentor is a role model who guides and advises someone at the beginning of their career. In this case, that can mean someone new to extension, new to teaching, new to working with growers, new to produce safety. Now, I don't know about you, but I'm not any of those things, and I still appreciate having a mentor. Yes, my mentor is a role model who I can call when I need guidance or advice, but more than that, they provide support and an open atmosphere for discussion. Without a doubt, I would not be where I am today without my mentor. In my previous extension position, I served as a mentor in a formal capacity for a few of our new hires. But today I want you to consider your ability to provide mentorship to those in your training team, regardless of where they're at in their career. Every single person on this call can provide mentorship to others. Next slide, please. So what does mentoring look like? And now I'm talking specifically about your PSA training team. I recommend meeting with your team a couple of times a year to touch base, as well as when you're planning a specific course. If you're building a team that will be training together long term, treat them as such. Ask questions such as, 
Why do we do what we do? What does success look like? How must, how must we act to ensure success? The answers to these questions can help the team as a whole develop priorities and goals for the year and can help reinforce to each trainer that they're part of something important. Communication is key and is really a two-way street. So we wanna actively listen to the members of our training team. What are their strengths? What are their weaknesses? What are their concerns about training? Does their enthusiasm light up the room when they talk with growers about making compost? Well, then module three is a great topic for them to teach. But more than that, are you working on a fact sheet or a video or a workshop on that topic that they could help with? Really take advantage of your team's strengths. Are they terrified at the thought of teaching module five one? If so, how could you encourage them? How could you help them gain confidence in that topic? Maybe there's a fact sheet, an article, or a website that you could recommend they read. Is there a professional development activity nearby on that topic? Can you set up a Zoom call for them to practice before the actual course? So again, if we're really building our training teams, we're thinking about them and how we can help them throughout the year, not just right before the training. Demonstrate respect for each trainer's time and contributions. If you're the state lead or even just the lead trainer of an individual course, do you communicate with your team on a regular basis? Does everyone know which modules they'll be teaching and do they need anything from you? All right, now it's the day of your course and you're expecting a room full of participants. Are you running around trying to get set up when the first growers arrive? Or is everything ready so you can greet them at the door and have a calm check-in process? It makes a big difference. Stress is contagious. Being organized and prepared is one of the best things you can do for your training team as well as your participants. Don't be afraid to delegate tasks. Who's in charge of the registration or check-in desk? Who's the timekeeper for the day? If someone is teaching a module for the first time, let's all pay particular attention so we can provide feedback later. And then remember to thank your training team at the end of the day for the important role they played. I know all the team members are eager to get home at the end of the day, but I encourage you to set the expectation that everyone stick around at the end to make sure the room is cleaned up and the training materials organized, as well as to immediately discuss as a team how the training went and what could be improved in the future. And I'll talk about that feedback more on the next slide. The last thing I wanna mention about your mentoring role is to be a good example when training. Thinking of, and I think that's the next um, bullet point, Gretchen. Yeah, I think of this like a sports team and you're the team captain and all your teammates are looking to you for leadership. I'm not talking about your knowledge on the topics of each module. I'm talking about your organization skills, your ability to stick to the agenda, how you engage your audience, how you answer grower questions, how you weave personal experiences and examples into your teaching. We all know what good teaching looks like. And I'm the first to admit I am far from perfect, but I do try to set a good example so that when I give other trainers suggestions for improvement, it's not a case of do as I say, not as I do. All right, next slide, please. So that brings me to the important topic of how to provide helpful feedback. I like to provide verbal feedback at the end of the day, as soon as all the growers have left the room. And if that's not possible, I'll type up an email either that night or the next day, while the course is still fresh in all the trainers' minds. And usually I just, I just share individual trainer feedback with that trainer. Um, there have been states, again, where we do it a little bit differently, but if I'm emailing, I typically just email that individual trainer. But it's really valuable to sit around in a circle after the training and everybody get to give feedback to everybody else. So that would be my preference. As a lead trainer or team member, you should not only make recommendations for changes, but also comments on the strengths of the trainers and what they did that worked especially well in the course. 
again, we're all learning from each other in this process. And remember to use specific examples from the course, including quotes and details. And the only way to do that is if you're paying attention all day and taking some notes. I know my memory is shot there. I can't remember what happened in module one unless I write it down. All right, so the five characteristics of helpful feedback are shown on this slide. And these come from the Quality Matters program, which some of you may have heard of. It provides a framework for reviewing online courses, but I find that it's really helpful for providing any type of training feedback. So I'm gonna run through um, this um, circle here, giving you some examples. So the first is constructive. Try to offer solutions and not just identify problems with someone's training. Number two is specific. Include a specific example of what is being recommended. So again, if we take notes, we're able to give more specific feedback. Next is measurable. Suggest ways that trainers will know a recommendation has been implemented. So next time you teach module three, it would be great if you did X, Y, and Z on this slide. And then the next time that person teaches module three, you and them will be able to know if they did it or not. Measurable. Number four is sensitive. So keep recommendations and comments on a positive note, especially if we're talking in a circle. We don't wanna seem like we're picking on one person. So we're gonna keep our language positive, avoiding the use of negative language. And this box gives you some examples of how to frame those sentences. You can say things like, you might wanna consider doing this, or when I teach module two, this is what I do. Or it would be helpful if, it appears that, you might indicate on this slide, blah, blah, blah. It might be useful to, or I had a clear sense of what you were talking about on this slide, however, I was confused when you started talking about meat, you know, whatever, um, or I'd like to suggest, rather than, wow, that really sucked. <laughs> you know, you wanna stay positive and frame things in a helpful way. And then finally, balanced, pointing out strengths as well as weaknesses. Okay, next slide. So then putting it all together, um, a good method to practice is this sandwich method. Thanks, Gretchen. So number one, we're gonna give a compliment. So that allows us to achieve both sensitive and balanced feedback. Number two, we're gonna give some sort of constructive citation. You could cite the produce safety rule, right? It doesn't say potable water. Um, you could cite guidance. You could cite resources from the Department of Agriculture or the local university. It could even be your experience as a trainer, okay? So again, everybody on the training team has experience with trainings and can provide this feedback. And then finally, a recommendation, which is specific and measurable, and give examples. So as an example, I might say, the way you paused and asked participants about their employees and languages spoken was good, as were the examples you shared from your experience on the farm, such as kale in the armpit, workers taking ownership by reporting concerns. But on slides with a section symbol, it would be helpful if you highlighted that and directed participants to the notes for more information. For example, on slide 15, the definition of dropped covered produce would be good to read through, especially since we had an apple grower in the audience and apple drops have traditionally been harvested as seconds. So that example included all of these pieces. I used positive language. I pointed out strengths as well as areas for improvement citing a certain component of the curriculum that was being underutilized. I was specific with what I was recommending, and I explained it in a way that we will know if the recommendation is implemented next time. It takes some practice, but this allows you to give really helpful feedback if you keep these five components in mind. And even when a course is satisfactory, there may still be opportunities for improvement and as the lead trainer or any member of the training team, you should strive to offer suggestions for improvement. 
Feedback is the key to quality courses. Next slide, please. All right. So tips for trainers. I focused a little bit on the lead and, and going through the trainings, but now each one of us is a trainer. So thinking about our own self-improvement, all trainers should aim for continual improvement. Even those who've been doing this for years, there's always room to improve. I encourage you to think about it before, during, and after training and utilize your training teammates. You may wanna have a call before the course, or meeting the morning of to ask for specific ideas and for them to give you feedback at the end of the day. You may also want to discuss the specific areas that you would like to improve. So maybe there's a new activity you're going to try for the first time and you really want feedback of how well that goes or what you could do to make it better. Maybe this is your first time teaching a certain module and you're worried about the questions that are going to come up and how you'll handle them. So ask a teammate to be prepared to back you up in that situation. Nobody likes to be put on the spot, even if they're the subject matter expert. So without warning, of course, that would be the moment they were checking their email and they wouldn't even know what the question was. So warn them ahead of time if you're gonna expect backup. And that brings me to my next point. As much as possible, be present for the whole training. Pay attention to how each module is taught and the best practices used by your training teammates and be prepared to help them answer questions and then give your teammates feedback at the end of the day even if you're new your feedback is valuable because you've sat through trainings before again you know what good teaching looks like next read the course evaluations i don't know how much stronger i can say that <laughs> read the course evaluations they will help you improve but you need to learn how to take constructive criticism, so develop a bit of a thick skin. Learn from that criticism or, or the happy comments that you'll, you'll get on some evaluations, and then use it. The things that go well, do more of, right? The things that you receive criticism on, see how you can improve. And then the last thing on this slide, I really encourage you to start a folder for upbeat notes, thank you cards, and positive evaluation comments. It could be a folder on your computer, it could be screenshots, or it could be an actual file folder in a cabinet. Now, some people call this a cheerleading folder or a CYA folder for check your anatomy or other A word you might like to insert there. Um, but it's a great reminder for yourself on rough days when you're wondering why you ever got into this training program to begin with. Um, I know I've had trainings like that where nothing went well or the people just didn't like me and that's okay right but it's nice to have some upbeat notes to read through and realize that you're doing just fine so a cya folder next slide please all right and then i just wanted to um, briefly mention these remark reports it's great to go through those evaluations at the end of your grower training, but you can request this summary report by emailing Michelle Humiston. I've put her email address on the slide. Um, if you're a lead trainer, you can request those reports. And so it, it tabulates, it does all the statistics to tell you what the evaluations are per course. These are great for end of year reports or to compare trainings over a season, maybe to compare different um, trainers for different modules. Um, there's a lot of really great information and then it's only like 14 or 15 pages so it's much better than reading the individual evaluations from each grower in the room. So I just wanted to briefly mention those. Um, I find them really useful and again all you have to do is if you're a lead trainer um, email Michelle Humiston and she'll get those to you. All right now shifting gears I want to talk about preparing for the unexpected. So I think this is really important as you build capacity in your training team to think about these what if topics. There's one more Gretchen. So what if these things happen during a training? Would you know what to do? If you're the state lead and you happen to not be there that day, would everybody on your team know what to do? 
So that's why it's good to have these conversations before the training. So again, maybe if you meet once or twice a year, these are some good what ifs to run through. Um, for example, what if someone in the training becomes hostile, aggressive, rude, or continually interrupting a trainer? What are you going to do about it? Right? And there's not one right answer. Every training team is going to be different. Um, I know I myself do not like conflict. I would not want to be the person responsible for talking to that rude person. But you need a plan for what you're going to do if that happens. Um, same if someone's telling offensive, discriminatory stories and jokes. Um, what are you going to do? What if someone faints or suffers an allergic reaction or goes into cardiac arrest? Do you have someone on your team with first aid experience? Do you know who to call if you're at a remote extension office? Because every county might be different. So it's good to think through those things ahead of time. What if someone has an emotional breakdown and talks about suicide? What would you do? Would you know who to call? How would that be handled? Um, what if someone comes in for warmth or food during a training, but they're not a grower? They just wandered in off the street. How would you handle that? Or what if there's a report of a bomb or an active shooter nearby? Similar to the emergency plan you have at home for your family, Having talked through these scenarios and other what ifs, having talked through them ahead of time, will empower your team to know what they should do if these happen during a training. I encourage you to research the resources available in your specific state so you're prepared if you're ever faced with one of these situations during a training. And like I said, I don't think there's one right answer, but I do know that if we as leaders and mentors work with our training teams long term, and we get to know each individual and their strengths, together we can achieve great things, even when faced with challenges like these. Next slide, please. So here's a short list of resources to get you started. Again, this is a very short list. I know there's many, many more resources out there. There's some great things from Cornell University on here. Um, I like the fact sheet about diffusing angry and hostile ranchers. That would also apply to vegetable growers. And then the third one down, what to do until the doctor comes first. This is a 1980 version. I'm sure there are newer versions online, so I've put in parentheses there to look for an updated local version. So chances are there is some sort of equivalent hanging in your local extension office but it basically has different tabs for different medical emergencies. So how to deal with a patient who has gone into cardiac arrest? How do you deal with someone who fainted? How do you deal with someone who had an allergic reaction? So I'm sure there are newer and more local resources out there, but I think it's a good, um, it just gives a little paragraph for each one of those medical emergencies. So if you're aware of additional resources that would be useful to the trainers across the country, please share them in the chat and we'll make a bulleted list of these URLs to share after this call. Next slide, please. All right, and that is the end of my prepared slides. I'm now gonna turn it over to Annalisa Holtberg from the University of Minnesota, and she's gonna talk about how they've built capacity in the Minnesota training team. Annalisa? Great, thank you, Connie. Can you hear me okay? Yep. Great, thank you. And thank you to the PSA for inviting me. It's an honor to speak to you all, my peer educators around the country who I know also are leading great teams. So I won't talk for too long so that we can leave some time for a round table afterwards and to hear from you. So think about um, other tips that you'd like to share with the group as well. Um, so again, my name is Annalisa. I'm an extension educator at the University of Minnesota. So I work statewide. I lead the team here within Extension. I work really closely with our State Department of Agriculture, um, and I also work closely with my colleague Ann Sawyer, um, who is actually having a baby today, so she gets a pass because <laughs> she's in the hospital having a baby. Um, so I came up with a metaphor for you all, and it's a cruise ship. Now, I know what you think of when you think of a cruise ship, and it is probably aerosolized norovirus particles. But today we're using it to think about how to build a structure for a good training team. So the reason I thought cruise ship was it's 
big, it's complicated, um, it can be difficult to build. The crew is sort of specialized, but once you build the structure, once you hire the right crew, provide them the ongoing training and education and skill development that they need to, to run this ship, it can go pretty well and it can get you to where you want to go, whatever your end goal is or whatever your end destination is. Of course, we're adjusting mid-trip, we're providing monitoring um, and, and making those changes as we need to. Um, but that's the kind of metaphor that I think that I use to think about our team. And so maybe you can also do that. But and also, you know, ships are fun and they bring us to tropical destinations. So I'm having fun doing this. So I hope you are too. Okay, next slide, please. So a little bit more about uh, the basic ways that I can think to describe some of the steps that we've been doing over the past three years. First, finding and recruiting the right team members is paramount. Um, you know, the the training is the trainers in, in many ways. So finding the, the people who are best suited, whatever that means to you, um, is, is most important, I would say. And then providing that ongoing education, help build their skills, help empower them. Those are the kind of things I'll talk about today. And then give them the wheel, offer them opportunities to practice this new materials, um, but then maintaining and adjusting as needed as well, managing that, that communication piece. All right, next slide, please. So our crew, we have 34 total trainers in the state. Um, approximately 23 are actively leading our training teams, nine of whom are farmers. I, I have a slide specifically about that since that's slightly unique to our state. Um, and eight are from our Department of Agriculture Produce Safety Program, and then six from Extension. So Ann and I are focused on produce safety. The other Extension folks are our local educators and other Extension folks who work around the state. Um, they might have a much smaller time dedicated to produce safety, but generally work in horticulture. We have... Um, uh, each trainer trains about two to three grow trainings per winter. So I would like to have them train at more if possible, but you know, we're, we're not always able to host as many um, as we'd like to get everyone lots and lots of trainings. Um, a lot of them focus on two to three module specialties. So, you know, they might focus on module two and four and six if they're farmers, for example. Partnerships are really important and I bring it up here from the beginning because it's really foundational to our work. So we've been doing GAPS education long before the rule came along and we've engaged a lot of the farmers and a lot of our partners. We have a really strong um, nonprofit section here, sector here in the state that works with farmers. So uh, I am sure that many of you are doing this as well, but I really just encourage you to, to reach out specifically to those organizations because they help to make your training team even better because they can send more trainers your way, they can help promote your trainings, um, and they can really offer that critical feedback that sometimes it takes an outsider to give you. So um, I just wanted to mention that at the, uh, at the beginning. All right, next slide, please. Just some pictures of our happy trainers. Um, there's Connie at one of our trainings last year on the left there. So you see we have five trainers. That's that's pretty normal, four to five. I recognize that as we uh, funds shift, we might not always be able to have that many trainers, but for right now it has worked out. Um, and then in the upper right, you'll see we're leading a, a hand washing demo there. We like to bring our little uh, hand washing stand there. All right, next slide, please. So a word about our development, kind of how we got to where we are, so and, and how we've um, continued to provide education to our team members. We had our first year in the trainer in October 2016, our second in November of 2017. Most of our crew attended in the 2017 um, training. We've had 25 grower trainings, and we've trained 475 attendees during those grower trainings. So we do take that team approach, like I said. We always have a Department of Agriculture staff present modules, and then also an inspector there 
generally in the back of the room offered uh, able to offer um, ideas about inspections and just uh, be another backup for the Department of Agriculture there. Um, and then we always have at least one U of M extension person training. And then we always have a farmer trainer. And then I always like to hire, I am a lead trainer, but I do really like to have another lead trainer in the room. And if funds allow, I would really suggest that, like Connie was saying, to to be able to offer that outside critique. Um, Connie gave excellent, excellent feedback at that training that you saw her pictured at. Um, it, it is really nice to have an outside voice. And, you know, I prep everyone. I say, you know, we're adults, we're professionals. We will be going over what could be improved. I think that's a, a luxury, frankly, to be able to have someone give you that. Um, and it, people really, really do like that. So both verbally, but then also the written afterwards. Um, I think it really improves. And just having an, a, another uh, person answering those those questions, um, it, I think it, it improves everybody. We do pay the farmer trainers $1,000 with our CAP funds for each training. So that includes attending all of the Zoom prep sessions that I'll talk about. It includes all their own prep time. I really do expect them to show up prepared and they do show up prepared that's all their travel that's all their per diems and meals um, of course they have to pay taxes on that thousand um, dollars and then they of course stay for the entire day so it it does seem like a, a chunk of change and I guess it is but by the time you start thinking about all that the hourly becomes very reasonable um, and I feel that people need to be paid for their good work so just a note about how we've kind of divvied it up uh, the, the trainings, particularly the U of M, I manage assigning all the modules. I do that well in advance. I usually do that in about August or September before the training season. Developing the activities and clicker slides. Now, of course, this is in conjunction with the training team. Um, and then providing the education to trainers and a lot of communication, just making sure everyone's on the same page. And then as per the trainings, of course, our Department of Agriculture staff does much more than that, but just for the training team particularly, they're managing the registration, that online process, they're registering the course with FDO and PSA, they're getting a room, the food, um, mailing in the roster for certificates and mailing in those eval sheets. So that's, we've just worked over the past few years to kind of divvy that out and it helps to make the whole team feel more cohesive when everyone knows what they're doing. All right, next slide, please. So a note about a, 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 a thing that we developed. Um, also, I will give a, give a shout out to Don Seckle, PSA. Thank you for this idea, credit where credit is due. So I said, you know, we have a team from all over the state. We have a pretty big state geographically. How are we all going to get together? I did actually pull us together in person for the first time and I, it's just with travel time, it is, it's too challenging. So I said, let's have a Zoom call where we all practice our modules together. So that's what we started doing. And so we've done it two years running now and it, it works pretty well. So it's in November, it's all online. Everybody who's assigned a module, so if you will be presenting module two in the upcoming training season, I assign you a specific slides within a module and then you present that to two other people who are also presenting that and then me as well. So we all just co-lead that module together. And then we talked about what worked and what didn't, really using those, those great ideas that Connie gave us um, to talk about, hey, I really liked it, but it seemed like you were kind of struggling with module or with slide six, for example, you know, what happened there? What else do you need? Um, and we, it, it does take time, but I, I really find, I think that they find that it's really helpful. And the other thing is it gets them thinking about it well in advance of the training because everybody is, very busy, of course. My farmers have been in the field all summer. They're not thinking about this stuff, and that's completely understandable. We have a very short growing season here, so it's intense. Um, so in November, then it's kind of like, all right, let's start thinking about this again. And I, I would be wary if I didn't do this, that they would maybe put it off because that's human nature. I mean, I put off stuff as well. Um, but I will also note that we really do talk about when the activities will be happening and then we also use um, supplemental slides and clicker slides. So we talk about those. All right, next slide, please. This is just an example of you. So you can maybe picture a little bit more what I'm saying. So module two, you see on November 13th, Anne presented slides one through 12, Laura did 13 through 25, and Joan did 26 through 36. And then I sat in on it. And then we all discussed afterwards. So that's how that went. The downside is it takes a lot of time for me particularly, but 
I, I think it's, uh, it's very well worth the time. All right, next slide, please. Um, this is pretty basic. Many of you are probably doing this, but it's just using a shared Google Drive. Um, I think that it's nice to have all the stuff in one spot. Of course, we can say, you know, go to the PSA site. They have lots of resources. Well, it's also really nice if it's all just in one spot. So we have all the slide sets that we use. We do put in clickers, like I said, and some supplementals. We have a 1.1 where we go over exemptions and exclusions, for example. I always put the most current version in there in that PowerPoint set so they know where to get there. And then all the supporting materials so they can read up on their different modules. All right, next slide, please. So here are some other opportunities for professional development that we offer. So we do do just Zoom meetings in addition to those Zoom prep calls. We also just do a meeting in roughly August and then October. So August would be the planning call. Where should we have the, the trainings? How many do we need to have? Who do we need to um, engage to promote them? Like who are the partners on the ground? That's kind of more of a planning call. October is, okay, we've set the dates. This is where they'll be. We create a Google map and say this is where they're going to be. Um, we also give updates during that, during both of those meetings. If there's anything new that has come up from FDA, for example, I recognize, again, that this is a small portion of a lot of our, my training team's lives, so they might not be staying abreast of, of everything, and that's totally fine. So we do that on those calls. Um, and then during the training season, it's just probably, generally too busy so we don't do a call um, again until April which is sort of a what happened how many trainings did we have what could be improved and people um, log on as they're able of course it's not completely required but um, I feel like with only three calls a year it, it everyone should try to get to it and, and most really do so we also just have a lot of discussion it's not not anybody just presenting we have a listserv, which is just as basic as making a good old Google listserv. Um, and so by having that, then they can use that to write to the whole team. Of course, I said, you know, don't overuse that and no one does, but it's nice when I just want to say, hey, there's been a change to the schedule and I just want to get it to all the trainers. We do that. I also encourage them to get on these calls and then our North Central Region listening sessions that are monthly. And then there are other opportunities that cost money but um, or a lot more time. Uh, we had a News and Brews deep dive, a day and a half long workshop this last fall that trainers could attend, the advanced training that we just had in Florida last week our answer our um, annual meeting these are examples of kind of if they had more time and really wanted to delve into the details they could attend those as well and I would help them look for funding to cover that all right next slide please all right a note on our farmer trainers so I I think this is one of the coolest aspects of what I get to do is work with these farmer trainers because they really make the farm the trainings great um, they're a trusted, authentic, positive voice in the room. They are, they speak with authority because they're speaking from experience. If they say record keeping has all these benefits on my farm, for example, X, Y, Z, it's really difficult for anybody to say, mm, I don't believe that because it's their lived experience. It's not anyone's opinion. It, it is their truth. So when they speak, people really do listen. They give really good specific ground tested gaps suggestions. This is how I color code my tools. This is how I've developed a schedule for um, monitoring the cleanliness of our bathroom. You know, whatever it might be, they really do come, come through with great suggestions that really often resonate with the room. Um, when they talk, really the room listens up. Um, they often don't speak regulatory talk, um, but that's fine and they definitely know their modules and know the requirements of the rule, but they're speaking in, in plain language. They're speaking about their farming operations and the regulation um, at the same time. They really do well at those double smileys, the added benefits of food safety. So if we're talking about using sanitizers, they're able to say, yes, it does reduce the potential for cross-contamination in my bulk water, wash water. It also really does improve the shelf life of my produce, particularly my leafy greens. And I would, I would never consider not using it on them because I've noticed that they are just of a higher quality when I use that. So when a farmer says that, it's, the room says, huh, okay, wow, 
that's that sounds great. I, I think I'm going to really look into that. Tell me where you got your sanitizer, all that. Um, and their passion, they really do have excitement and passion for it. I, you know, have really worked to to find great, passionate farmers, and and they they blow you away. So some of the challenges are they, of course, are very busy. Um, for often, it's not their primary job, although I, there are a couple of extension folks that I work with that are also farmers, so they do a little bit of both. Um, funding, of course, you have to pay. I, I, all of our farm, all of our trainers get paid, but um, you do have to find the the funding specifically for the farmers. Um, and then just recruitment. Just a note on recruitment that, of course, all farming scales are different. So, just something to keep in mind if you had a very small scale farmer and they were speaking to very large farmers, that the mm, terminology they might use or their kind of um, focus might be a little bit different. So, think about recruiting a diverse pool of farmers so that they can speak to lots of different scales. All right, next slide. Okay, some pictures here. So upper right is Laura from Loon Organics um, talking about module two. And then um, Joan in a, the upper left, who actually gave an excellent presentation on module two um, on one of these calls. And you can see her presenting. And then this one on the bottom is David Abbas, another of our farmer trainers. And I, I put it in there because I like it. He's in the middle of the room. Like he has walked out there and the room is following him with their eyes. They, they love him. They can't get enough of him. They're smiling. Um, he's, he's really engaged with the materials and with them, most importantly. And they respond to that really well. So, all right, next slide, please. So some other specifics. Um, these are things that we do as trainers to engage the participants. And also, I think that they make the day go more smoothly, like that organization that Connie was talking about makes the training team more happy, which makes the entire day go better. So we always start with a 10 minute intro. I developed a whole additional slide set. I mean, it really takes five to 10 minutes. It's probably more like five minutes. What's the difference between gaps and a gap audit and the PSR? Many of our growers aren't familiar with that. I think it's important to say from right from the beginning, kind of what are we doing here? So we do that. Uh, we also have a fact sheet with our uh, folder with a lot of our printed fact sheets. Um, it, I really like that because then the trainers can kind of fall back on it. They can say, oh, yep, uh, remember that the required records PSA fact sheet is in your folder. So it kind of takes some of the heat off them to have it in paper there as opposed to just, oh, well, you know, it, it, you can go online and get it. We do, do a drawing for the hand washing stand here. So you'll see um, at the bottom there um, that, that participant and I, I've, you know, that's what he's getting. And then you can see how happy she is. Really, people are so happy to get this. Um, and it leaves, when they leave happy, they, they generally are happy. We do not give them the stand. We give them the seven gallon uh, aquatainer and then the dishpan drawer, which fits there, as you can see in that hand washing stand, and then a pack of paper towels and then a thing of liquid soap. That's what they get. It costs about $20 total for those materials. I take their name tags, put them in one of these different drawers and draw one winner. Um, and we also give them the jump drives with all the printed materials. Of course, the template is, uh, the food safety plan template is sure nice to have in a jump drive as opposed to paper. We always set up the night before. Again, this just makes the day go smoother and makes the trainers happier if everything is all the, you know, we have enough chairs and tables and all those things have been thought through. And we do use the compression each module and these as schedules allow. Again, I think it, um, the trainers really like it and it, I think it makes them feel more connected with the audience. All right, next slide, please. So just a note on the fact that we use a modified agenda. This also came from the trainers. This was their idea basically because they saw people struggling with 5-1 after lunch. So we do do this and I'll send this to anybody if you want. I mean, it's, it's nothing magical, but we do the 5-1 um, right before lunch and then we do 5-2 after lunch and then we go back to 3 and 4 and 6 and 7. And the other thing to note is that I don't put all the times so you'll just see it's from 9 to 10 30 is when we're doing that and then 10 30 to 12 15 is when we're doing that so you know how people get really stressed out about oh we're five minutes over module two well we know we'll we'll make up for it in in five two or seven it's fine but they don't always know that and that we were noticing a lot of stress so some of the trainers had the idea of not putting all of the specific times on the agenda all right next slide please So, um, and 
there has been, this might be the most important thing I think that has come out of developing this ship is that we have now a group of trainers that are able to talk about gaps, that are able to talk about the rule and they are not just, you know, wherever you might be in, in a metro area or something, they're all over the state and they work with all these other organizations. Um, so the fact that they're able to, to do these other things um, which will get us to our goal of behavior change and improve food safety on the farm um, has been very important. They really are our advocates. As we know, there are definitely people who might be in meetings who might stand up. I've heard this just not too long ago. Someone stand up saying, well, you know, this FISMA is going to put all of our farmers out of business and make us all want to quit farming. And it's, you know, really, really negative. And then they're able to stand up and say, you know what, I, I'm actually a part of those trainings. And most of the stuff in there really is helpful and we we're doing it anyways and it protects our industry and these things so they're there because we you know as a few people can't be everywhere so they're everywhere um so it really helps to have more people i would say around the state and then just offering these non-grower training educational offerings so these are the things that we're developing and i'm sure and i know that all of you are also developing these sort of things so half days on water or composting on the farm cleaning and sanitizing um, we are developing a program that we're going to do with our ipm crew bugs you see and bugs you can't so they'll talk about insects and we'll talk about you know microbiological issues so those are the kind of things that I, th I see us doing a little bit of a mid-cruise adjustment here as we develop those non-grower training offerings. Next slide, please. So this is a picture of taking some footage of one of our farmer trainers in our hoop, in her to hoop. So we're um, taking video there for online gap modules that Anne is creating with a specialty crop block grant, for example. So um, Laura is a great advocate and a trainer and then we're able to turn to her and say, hey, can we pay for some of your time to come and shoot a video on your farm? But those are some other issues. Also reviewers, they're great reviewers. They're the end users. So they're able to say, you know what, this, <laughs> I, this language is way too complicated in this fact sheet, let's bring it down a notch. Um, and then engaging them to present at conferences as well. All right, next slide. So this on the left is a conference presentation that we just did. So this was a gap audit, um, how to get a gap audit, just a basic conference presentation we did. So I brought in a gap auditor and then also a farm that had been audited. And you can see afterwards, it was just thrilling to me because I'm, you know, a dork like that. But to see those two, she, the, the attendee came up and said, how, you know, tell me more about your SOPs and what do your log sheets look like? And the farmer was so happy to share and she was taking a picture of her log sheets and they swapped emails. So that farmer to farmer learning is again, just really important. Um, and then other things like uh, school garden training for food safety. So it's this is a great opportunity for a farm or for a trainer and a farmer or whoever to another trainer to come and lead a gaps session because it's not PSR specific I mean they could do a PSR one but also they know gaps well so all right next page so we have had to make, we are able to make adjustments mid-course. So enrollment has been lower this year for us. Um, I've heard from many of you that it has as well. So um, we didn't need 11 courses, it turns out. Um, so we're gonna cancel three and that's okay. We're working with our trainers to use them, to, to work with them to do those other sort of ideas that I mentioned. We have only 70 to 100 covered farms roughly that's the best estimate right now so developing those ideas those trainings for the qualified exempt and exempt farms is really important um, and just to note that we do have um, these other trainings in the works we've hosted two spanish trainings we've brought in um, laura acuna from psa to be the lead trainer in those and we've had one uh, plain amish community training and we have another one scheduled in March which we will bring up a lead trainer from Kentucky for um, and then we're also developing the ability to do among language um, training as well and that's it that's it for me um, I hope that was useful and I look forward to hearing what other people have to say as well thank you Annalisa that was great now we have just a few minutes for those of you who are on this call um, to share some mentoring success stories from your life. Um, you can either raise your hand and Gretchen can unmute you or you can add your comments to the chat.
So feel free to share examples of something you've done to mentor the trainers you work with, but also examples of ways that you have been mentored that you've found particularly valuable. Yeah, so feel free to go ahead and raise your hand and I can unmute um, your line if you have something to share or feel free to share it in the chat box. And uh, while we're waiting, I, I just came up with one thing that I've noticed that may be a helpful tip to some of you developing teams is that one thing I noticed um, as we've developed various training teams around the Northeast is certain people latch on to certain subjects. And that's, that's great because that's their specialty area. But I notice as sort of their responsibilities in food safety grow that, you know, they may start to reach out and need to do other modules um, because other people can't attend those trainings. So I think encouraging people to kind of test out the waters with different modules each time, you know, especially if there's a lead trainer present there to give them feedback is especially important because I know we have some people that are very focused in, you know, their lives outside of food safety and the specialty that they serve in the community. But I think, you know, if they're going to continue on their path of development, even as a lead trainer, they will need that experience. So taking, you know, the next step and encouraging those people who have delivered, you know, module three or module six, you know, every single grower training to step out um, of the comfort zone and, and try something new is, is something that I encourage you all to do as you develop your teams. No one has anything to share. I see some names in here that have uh, lots of training experience. I would love to hear, you know, what's well, what worked well or what didn't even. Uh, Don was just pointing out that one thing the Minnesota team does, as you saw in the last slide, is actually bring in a guest trainer or a, a lead trainer who can help the training team meet the needs of a specific audience. And I think that's a great point. Um, trying to reach a specific audience may require some specialty training or experience there to be effective. Anybody on the PSA team have experiences to share? This is Betsy. Hey. I think that, I think with always with your training with people, it's always good to um, actually encourage every trainer at the event to provide constructive feedback to the other trainers. So the lead trainer may have, um, you know, may be viewed as the person or is the person with all of the four areas that we like to have focused on. But I think every trainer has something to add. And um, I also think it then builds a little community amongst people to be able to provide that uh, constructive criticism. I think the thing is, is as you train more and more, you realize you can always be given constructive feedback, um, regardless of how long you've been doing this. And I think people that remain open to that are always gonna be set to improve. I also think within a group, it helps build that idea that we're all going towards improvement. All of us, lead trainers, other trainers, we're all in that path. And, um, and I think it's people that you train with, maybe that you don't train with all the time, will be able to highlight things about your presentation, um, both good and bad. So first of all, if you use examples that are really good and it really resonates, that's good to know. But if you have ticks that are driving people crazy, like saying, um, eight million times, they could point that out as well. So I, I just think encouraging people, no matter who they are in the training team, to provide feedback to the other trainers is a good way to build a collective um, focus on moving everyone forward. Great, thanks for sharing that. Um, I see Phil also shared that he loves seeing how other people present. That's always helped him better understand how to get better as a presenter. And I would agree, I would say, you know, I give a lot of credit to Betsy because many of the stories that I use in my trainings were learned from sitting through her trainings even before the PSA launch. So anytime you have the opportunity even to attend and take notes and listen to other stories, I think that's where you pick up a lot of good helpful hints. Connie, I'm starting to see a few come in here. So if I'm missing some, feel free to jump in here. Um, 
Kara was sharing how that she really loves how Connie makes notes of good examples that other trainers use and pointed them out to the teams. That's a method that she wanted to implement and to add to the list of concrete examples um, that her team can use. Again, it's so important to make note of those good things as well as the things that could use improvement. Mm -hmm. This is Annalisa. I'll just add, um, I, I do think it's important to prep people ahead of time to know that we will be doing the after um, training debrief though. So in the email that I sent to the training team, generally two to three weeks before the training, I'll say, this is a reminder, this is what modules are on, this is the address, this is when we should arrive. Remember, we will be doing a 15 minute debrief afterwards um, and everyone should but i think it's a really good idea to point out everyone should be taking notes to share with everyone else so it's not a top-down sort of thing and it also pr prepares them mentally to know that they are not going to be able to leave until 5 30. <laughs> and which people are absolutely willing to do but if it's sprung on them it, they might be less willing yeah yeah that's great to outline right up front these are all great um, suggestions and, and comments. So if you have other things that you'd like to share with us, um, whenever I send out the uh, wrap up email from this meeting, I will definitely include Connie's email and um, Annalisa, if you're willing uh, to have me share your email again, um, feel free to share more of these stories with us and examples of ways you've helped build your team because I think that is helpful for everybody um, to hear as we all are facing a lot of the same challenges. Um, and I just, quickly want to thank Annalisa and Connie for putting this meeting together. I know these uh, things take time to pull together and we really appreciate the time that you've devoted to sharing this information with our trainers. Um, so I just, again, thank you for, for joining us on this educators call. You're welcome. Thanks for having me. It, it was an honor. Great. It's such an important topic. I appreciate the opportunity to talk about it. Yeah. Um, so before we close out the meeting, I'm going to turn it over to Betsy really quickly to talk about um, some of our curriculum manual uh, changes. Thanks, Gretchen. Um, a while ago, Gretchen sent out a survey asking people if they, if they preferred that the curriculum move to a spiral bound format. We currently had this in the Spanish um, manuals, but we did not have it in the English. If you remember, you all had to buy binders to put the materials into. Um, overwhelmingly, people preferred a spiral bound format, so that is exactly what we went with, and we are now ordering um, the next batch of manuals will be spiral bound. Um, I wanted to let you guys know, first of all, that we um, appreciated you providing feedback to that question so that we could make a decision that hopefully makes everybody happy or happier. Um, but I also wanted to tell you that the spiral binding costs us more. So we typically send out free pens and highlighters with the manuals and we will be moving away from that um, to absorb the increased cost of these spiral bindings. Um, I think what we are going to do, and I would love feedback on this, I think what we're going to do is give you an option to buy the pens if you really would like the pens to go with it the pens with the highlighter, but um, we will no longer be sending those out um, once the spiral bind bound versions come in. So if this is um, extremely worrisome to you or you have comments or any other feedback, please do let me know. But I wanted to give this group a heads up since um, this is sort of a new change, but we wanted to go in the direction that you all wanted us to go in and so we figured the additional cost was okay. You will be saving that cost of buying the binders so maybe you want to put it towards pens or maybe you don't um, but that'll be your option to decide moving forward. So I'll stop there and if there's any questions you can let me know um, either here you can raise your hand and we can talk about it or you can drop me a note. Great thanks for that update Betsy. Um, while you were talking, there was something that Martha brought up that I think is a really good point. And for you seasoned uh, training veterans that are on the call, um, I would love for you to weigh in on this one. But she's asking about, um, you know, what sort of recommendations would you give a trainer who is new to a team? 
to change the mindset of a team that has been in place for a while, to accept the idea of something like constructive feedback or discussion of areas to improve those trainings, or even just trying to incorporate activities into the trainings, not just doing PowerPoint slides. So you're, you're a newcomer into a team that's already established that maybe has some room for improvement. How do you get those people to accept your feedback? This is Betsy. Can I jump in on this one? Yeah, go for it. I was kind of targeting that towards you. <laughs> if you're new to the team, it's actually a great time, if you're new, to sort of say, hey, in other teams I've been on, uh, we provide constructive feedback, and I think it works really well, and have you guys thought about this, or would you be willing to do this? So I think if you're new, it's a great thing to sort of suggest as a new person on the team, and if you're new, I think it, it doesn't come off as being like, you all are not so good. I think we need constructive you know, feedback. If, even if you've been in a team for a while and you've never really thought about it and the team hasn't really done it, I think the way to say that is to say, either talk about this webinar and say, hey, I just you know, learned about this training and have been thinking about this and, um, and it's worked really well in other places, maybe we can try it. So um, it's easier if your group is sort of open-minded and not very defensive, but even if there are issues, I think you can make a very good data-driven argument to why using constructive feedback will be good for both the audience and the stakeholders, as well as people who are trainers. Because um, I think Connie said this multiple times, but you know, knowing what resonates and what works is just as valuable as knowing where your weaknesses are because it allows you to use those examples that are really effective for the stakeholders. And I think um, Annalisa's example was perfect. I mean, now that you've heard about that particular program, you could go to your team and say, hey, I, I heard these Minnesota folks have developed a really you know, effective training team and here's some of the things that they did. I was thinking maybe we could try out one or two of these things. Um, and Connie was even saying, point back to this webinar, it's recorded, watch the webinar and have them uh, maybe pick up some tips from here. For sure, absolutely. Yeah. And I think Annalisa's diverse team really, really allows it to highlight the value across the types of trainers, right? It's not just extension, it's not just growers, right? It's this swath of people and everybody benefits from the process. And uh, okay, just one last thing here from uh, Donna. She said that um, she's also had success as the new person on the team, several years new, but um, asking for others' input as a way to encourage that discussion is in, you know, what suggestions do you have on my presentation of module six? And reading through the evals can also prompt some of that discussion, but being careful not to call a specific person out. So you don't want to target anybody and make them feel particularly bad about their performance, but, you know, just trying to gain that uh, information in other ways. So I recognize we're a couple minutes over time, so that was all great discussion. I appreciate your contributions to there. And um, if there's any other stories you'd like to share with us, maybe we can do like a little section of our monthly newsletter where we share uh, success stories or challenge stories. Maybe that's a, some, an idea we can pursue. Um, but before we sign off, we uh, have not set the next date for the educators group meeting. We um, are still following up with some prospective speakers. So we're hoping to have one in March. It may get pushed a little bit further back into April, but we will send out um, any information about the next meeting as soon as we can through the listserv. And it'll also be posted on our website as soon as we pick a day and a time um, and know that the speaker is available. But as always, if there's other topics that you're interested in or you have a particular speaker that you think would be just fabulous to join us on this particular series, um, please do send that information to me. We're always open to making these meetings as effective and informative um, as possible for this particular audience. So with that, um, we hope you all have a great week. And again, I'll be following up with um, some of the resources we discussed today on this call. Um, the recording will be posted online uh, in a few days, and then I'll send out uh, some information about the next call whenever it is scheduled as soon as I have that information. So again, thanks to Annalisa and Connie, and uh, we hope you guys all have a great start to your February. Bye, thanks. All right, take care.